Have you ever felt that hard as either one of you tries, neither one of you is feeling loved or for that matter feeling sexually satisfied? It could be because you're not speaking each other's love and sex languages. Now, Kevin, we've both seen couples where each party is feeling unloved by the other and they just can't fathom why. So let's just get into talking about love languages, mm -hmm. talking about the five love languages. What's yeah. the first one? Well, the first one is acts of service. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's for people that like to do things and they show their appreciation and their love for their partner by doing things, maybe fixing the the uh, plumbing, you know, or bringing them, not necessarily bringing them something, but doing something to show them that they are important. And they also perceive love in that way. If you do Absolutely. something for me, I yes. feel loved. And yes. if you don't do anything for me, right. then I don't feel loved, which is a good segue into um, the next one, which is words of affirmation. Mm -hmm. So you can be saying all sorts of stuff to this person, but if you're not doing it, they're not going to feel it. And of course, if words of affirmation is someone's language, mm -hmm. they need to hear it to yes. believe it. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Yeah, and most likely you're going to be saying it too. If it is your language, you're going to be saying it a lot. You're going to be affirming your partner and mo very encouraging. And most likely that's something that you want to receive in return. Absolutely. And the yeah. next one? And the next one would be quality time. And that's just spending time. It could be walking, going for a walk, walking the dog. It could be going for a drive. Whatever it is, it's being with that other person. Just specifically carving out time with that carving person. Carving out time, yes. Making Absolutely. themselves a priority, their time a, a priority. priority. I yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, next one is touch. Oh, yeah. And being a sex therapist, I see a lot of people where they're having issues mm -hmm. in that area. The interesting thing is, and touch doesn't have to be sex. It no. can be h hugging Cuddling, cuddling, holding, spooning, yes. anything. But for a person whose primary language is touch, if touch isn't happening, they actually feel unloved. So it's mm -hmm. not just that my partner isn't attracted to me, it's I don't feel loved. Yeah, they feel love starved, don't they? They feel love starved, absolutely. Mm -hmm. The next one. And the, the last one would be gifts. Mm -hmm. And you know, you could go to Dollarama and buy something at the dollar store. Now, mm -hmm. probably a wedding ring or um, a, a nice, some nice jewelry or even a nice car might even be at the top of the scale, but it doesn't have to be about the gift as much as I'm thinking of you, I'm prioritizing you, mm -hmm. and I'm going to give you something because you're on my mind. Absolutely, and it's not the monetary value. I remember I had one of these uh, funky shower hats that sort of smelled icky and I wanted a new one, yeah. but I wasn't gonna have any time to go buy one. Right. And my husband went and purchased one, just a $6 item, sure. but it may as well have been a diamond ring because I felt, oh my gosh, yeah. you went out of your way yeah. to get me a gift that I needed in the yeah, moment. I'm thinking about your needs. I'm thinking about your needs. It's like I'm attending to you. Absolutely, I'm mm -hmm. attending to you. I've mm -hmm. thought, and it's the perfect gift because it's something that I want. You didn't just get something that you yeah. wanted. I have a funny story. Once this couple came over, and uh, I said, well, well, what brings you here? <laughs> the first question we asked, yes, right? Of course. And uh, sh she said, he doesn't love me. And he goes, what do you mean? I don't love you. I work till 11. I get up at 6 a.m. when it snowed. Mm -hmm. I shovel the snow. Yeah. I scrape the ice, warm up your car, make sure there's gas. Why do you think I do that? She says, yes, but you don't tell me. And he goes, and yeah, you keep telling me, but you don't show me. Mm -hmm. And immediately I realized hers was words of yeah. affirmation and his was absolutely acts of service. So it's like they're on a different plane almost. Yes. And obviously both of them loved each other because mm -hmm. they were trying very hard, but the other person just wasn't feeling yeah. it. Yeah at all. So let's talk about um, what are some of the things that we can do to be speaking the same language? Yeah, certainly I think it's important to understand yourself mm -hmm. because if you don't understand yourself then you're probably not going to be able to express your needs to your partner very mm -hmm. well. And this has come from um, Dr. Gary Chapman and he wrote the five love languages and so he has this resource online certainly so our, our viewers tonight could go to the Five Love Languages website and do the in online inventory. It's such a great quiz. I always encourage couples to do that. So sometimes they're surprised at, yeah. at their own love language. So yeah. you know what your love language is, you know what your partner's primary love mm -hmm. language is, and sometimes they can have a second language yeah. that's very close to it, but then you're loving them in their language. Because otherwise, literally, I like you used the word language, because yeah. otherwise it's literally, you might as well be speaking a different language and speaking loudly yeah. like this. Yeah doesn't make yes. any difference. Yeah, exactly. Kevin, while most people have heard of the love languages and possibly taken the quiz that we were talking about at one time or another, very few people have a clue around sex languages. Mm. 
Thankfully, my dear friend and world-famous author, Dr. Doug Weiss, who's known for his 30-day marriage makeover, has written a great book on the subject matter titled, what else? Five Sex Languages. There's so a theme running here. There's a there? theme running here, yeah. right? Uh, so why don't we let our audience in on what those languages are and what exactly do they mean? Do you want to take sure, away the first one? Sure, let me take one? the first one. Well, you know, this one seems rather um, predictable, fun. And obvious. And obvious, <laughs> isn't it? Fun. Yeah, fun. Uh, certainly, when we have sex, it should be fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people look for the adventure or the fun in it. And it has. If it's not fun, then it's not meaningful. It's not meaningful to them. And yeah. these are the people who love spontaneity, and they like different ways of doing things. So these people can even be risk takers because yeah, they want to have right. fun. They can be risk takers. So this can be the person who wants to, not suggesting you do this, you'll get busted, but maybe they want to be in the backseat of the car and there's this little risk mm -hmm. of getting caught. Yeah. But for them, that's just The extra thrill. The extra thrill, the it's adrenaline that goes in with the it. elevator. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you speak like a man who has been there. <laughs> Desire. Um, these are the people who n really need to be, who really need to be desired. They need to mm -hmm. be craved. I want you. I have to have you. And yeah. they need to know that you crave them, and they can never get enough of it. So you could be sending them texts or sex or whatever throughout the day, yeah. so that they really feel you crave them. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the the foreplay begins. It can begin hours yeah. before you actually get. It's a little into bit it. of an ego boost and 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 a primer. Could be. Yeah. And for somebody who is insecure I think it's lovely to know that you mm -hmm. desire me uh, a lot of women they after you know you, you've had a couple of kids you're getting older you start feeling invisible to the world mm -hmm. and if your partner turns around and says I want you I have to have you it's like okay yeah. you're so there yeah. um, and it begins the warm-up ahead of time so those insecurities start to melt away the lead up is the, important. the next one yeah is pleasure and that's for people that really need to feel that pleasure and feel that experience and, and just yearn for it. Mm -hmm. And ex again, there are people who love to expand their se sexual repertoire, mm -hmm. um, so they can be fairly adventurous. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad I'm doing the next one because I have a really good example. Okay. It's patience. These yeah. are the people who just want you to take their time with mm -hmm. them, like not rush them at all. Slowly lead up to it, tease, be gentle, but, but don't do it if you're going to let them down. Yeah. And when you make love, they like to lay in each other's arms for hours afterwards, or at least for really long time. They don't like the, the pump and dump. Um, so the funny story I was like going to tell... Like a crock pot. Like a crock pot. There yeah. you go. So the funny story I was going to tell you was, you know, uh, with my husband sometimes I'll say, okay, we have a couple of hours. Do you want to take some quality time, fool around? And, and he'd say, you're not going to sandwich me in between your clients. Absolutely <laughs> not. And I'm thinking, well, it doesn't usually take more than maybe an hour. We still have an hour to spare. And then when I read the book, I realized yeah. that that was the worst thing I could have said to oh. him because he wanted me to really take my time with mm -hmm. him and not make him feel rushed or like, you know, we're just doing it for the sake of doing yeah. it. So yeah. I think if, if we can really be cognizant of how our partner is appreciating mm -hmm. their sexuality and what gets to them, it's awesome. Yeah, take absolutely. away the final one. And so the last one would be acceptance and celebration. And uh, you've we need to be able to feel those these people need to feel that they are loved that they are cherished that the environment is right so these people want all of them to make love to all of you like they want to be all in this is a mind body soul experience for this person so you can't just get to sex and um, you know sex can begin hours before you because you do want to show them I accept all of you mm -hmm. I love all of you I want all of you sounds like a song I've heard recently oh really yeah. all of <laughs> me you? wants all of you all of me wants yeah. all of you yes. yeah actually you're right I heard it on the radio just the other day but that's the idea that you want to feel accepted and at the end of the day I I think um, sex language or not, we all have that need where we want to feel that a partner um, accepts us just the way we are. So mm -hmm. maybe you can just, just talk yeah, a little bit about Isn't it, isn't it beautiful when we can be fully accepted by our partner regardless of the flaws that we have? You know, they can see past that despite to accept the and despite mm -hmm. the flaws, yes. Certainly to accept us and to love us and to want to be with us, certainly in a very sexual way as well. Too. A sex-starved marriage is one where one spouse is desperately longing for more touch, more physical closeness, more sex, more physical affection. And the other spouse is thinking, 
what is the big deal? Would you just get a life? It's just sex. But to the spouse yearning for more sex and more touch, it's a huge deal because it really is about feeling wanted, about feeling loved, about feeling connected, about feeling masculine or feminine and attractive. And when this major disconnect happens, what also happens is that intimacy on all levels goes right out the door. They stop sitting next to each other on the couch. They quit laughing at each other's jokes. They don't spend time together. They stop being friends. And it places the marriage at risk of infidelity and divorce. Now, some of the reasons that people have low desire or an insatiable appetite for sex are very complicated and deep-seated. But I'm happy to tell you that the primary cause for a sex-starved marriage is also the simplest to solve. And before I explain that solution, I really want to go on record for saying that if you're sitting here thinking low sexual desire is a woman's issue, I want you to think again. Women do not have a corner on the low libido market. I'm convinced that low desire in men is one of our very best kept secrets. Now having said that, I want to also tell you about a little talked about fact. And that is when it comes to a sex starved marriage, the person with lower sex drive controls the sexual relationship. Now when I say that, I don't mean that this person is intentionally mean-spirited or unkind or manipulative. I just mean if that person isn't interested in sex, the partner may as well go take a cold shower because it's not going to happen. Now, I find this really curious on a couple of counts because when we think about how decisions are made in marriage, we generally think about mutuality. Two people decide when to get married, whether to have kids, how to raise those kids, what to do about the finances, the in-laws, who's going to do what around the house. But conspicuously missing from that mix is anything having to do with sex. What's it like, the nature, the quality, the quantity? I find this incredible. I know couples who have been married for 20 to 30 years who have never spoken about sex. The other thing that's really amazing to me about this unilateral decision making is one person decides no sex and expects the partner to accept it, not complain about it, and oh yes, you have to be monogamous. Now, this is an unworkable arrangement. Let me tell you about a couple in my practice. So meet John and Mary. They've been married for 15 years. And John's a real laid back kind of guy and he doesn't like to complain about much, except in the last 15 minutes of my session with him, he finally gets up the courage to tell me about something that had been bothering him for a long, long time. That there really is only a two hour window of opportunity on Friday nights between 10 and 12 where Mary might be interested in sex. And he knows not to bother her at any other time. Like you, laughing, I, I glanced over at Mary and Mary was chuckling because she recognized herself in that description. John wasn't laughing. He wasn't smiling. And so I said to him, John, what's this been like for you? And he said to me, I want to talk to Mary. He turned to her, took a deep breath. He said, when I reach out to you in bed and you're not there for me, the only thing I ever think about, I, I, are you attracted to me anymore? Do you love me like I love you? Do you want to be with me? And then when you go to sleep and I'm lying next to you and staring up at the ceiling, all I can think about is this is the loneliest feeling in the world, lying next to you in bed. And to Mary's credit, her eyes filled up with tears, and she reached out and grabbed John's hands. And she said, John, I have to tell you, in all the years we've been married, I never, not once, have thought about what it's like to be you. I only think about, am I in the mood? Am I not in the mood? I am so, so sorry. I'll do better. 
John began to cry. I began to cry. <laughs> For me, it was a magical moment because it was the first time in the history of their marriage that Mary was stretching outside her comfort zone to try to understand John's pain, his loneliness, his alienation, his need to connect with her. What have we learned about sex, romance, and passion? And you'd say, well, okay, so, you know, Masters and Johnson did their research and Kinsey did their research, all this research. There's only one thing that discriminates, well, two things that discriminate couples who have a great sex life from couples who have an awful sex life. The first is they stay friends when they have a great sex life. Love maps, fondness and admiration, and turning toward bids. That's what friendship is, okay? Second, they make sex a priority. It's not the last thing on a long to-do list. It's special. They make it important. That's the only thing that's different about couples who have a great sex life and couples who don't. The movies have a very bizarre, very deceiving view of sex. Two people come together, they don't have to communicate at all. They can create this incredibly intricate dance without saying one word to each other. They come together, they are immediately absolutely ecstatic, totally turned on. They immediately have simultaneous glorious orgasms and it only takes about, and you're laughing, but then, it only takes about what? I don't know, 70 seconds generally? If you're James Bond, it's even faster, right? If you're James Bond, it's just, oh, James. And then... But what impressed me the most that I want to tell you about was the way porcupines have sex. <laughs> and it was quite remarkable because the male porcupine has a special problem that no other mammal has. He cannot just mount the female because if her quills are up, he can really hurt himself. <laughs> so this is what happened in this film. The male porcupine and the female porcupine sat down in front of each other. And the male porcupine took his paws and put it on the female porcupine's face. And she closed her eyes and he rubbed her face. For a long time. <laughs> He was really patient. And then, after a while, he went around to the back. <laughs> until her quills were down. And then he mounted her. And I think that's really the way to bring the two sections of the bookstore together, <laughs> is the wisdom of the male porcupine. It's all about emotional communication. As a human beings, we are hardwired for connection. We are learning through some groundbreaking research in social neuroscience that our need to connect with people we love is more fundamental and more basic than our need for food and shelter. And the opposite is also true, that disconnection hurts. I mean, get this. When scientists look into the functional MRIs of the brains of people who have just experienced a recent divorce or they're brokenhearted because of a breakup, the exact same regions of their brains light up as in the brains of people who are experiencing physical pain. And the same is not true for other negative emotions like sadness and anxiety and fear just for rejection. Rejection's unique. Rejection hurts. So when your partner comes over to you and says, I'm looking at this amazing sunset and I want to share it with you, or I just read this incredible article and I want you to read it, or can we just turn off our cell phones on Friday night so we can spend some time together uninterrupted, or we haven't made love for a while, I'd love to snuggle in bed and make love to you. If we're not interested, if we're not in the mood, rejection hurts. So what are we supposed to do? Well, here are those three lessons I promised you in the beginning of my talk. Number one, we all have different ways of feeling connected to one another. We need to know our way, but we have to become experts in our partner's way of feeling connected to us. Number two, if you're with someone who's yearning for more touch and more physical closeness and more sex, don't delude yourself into thinking, it's just sex, it's like scratching an itch. 
Sex is a powerful way of connecting and bonding with somebody you love. And number three, when you get your partner's way of connecting to you, you don't have to fully understand it. You don't have to fully agree with it. You just have to do it. And you want to know why? Two reasons. From everything I've learned about relationships, healthy relationships are based on mutual caretaking. Plus, it's an act of love. Uh, what are some of the ways that uh, depression or anxiety can impact intimacy? Well, what happens when, when people get anxious is it uses up a lot of emotional energy mm -hmm. and leaves them quite emotionally fatigued and tired and you know, unable to have the energy for their partners or for themselves. Okay. To connect at any level. Yeah, so unfortunately, um, you know, they, besides feeling kind of spent and, and um, anxious, they, they just simply just don't have the, the extra energy to put into uh, intimacy. Mm -hmm. Or any interest, they've lost interest in everything. Right, and so, and what happens is along with um, anxiety often comes its, you know, evil twin depression. Mm -hmm. And depression has the um, sort of the markers of leaving people feeling flat, uh, losing interest in things they used to have interest in, and what happens is that translates into how they feel about their partners, okay? Mm -hmm. So, and what can happen is the partners can, um, if there's a lack of initiating or a lack of responsiveness to initiation, mm -hmm. they can actually, the partners can sometimes feel quite rejected and get impatient they with their... Personalize mm -hmm. it. So yeah. uh, what tips would you have for both sides in such a situation? Like for the person who is depressed, any tips for them and for the partner so they can sort of negotiate that territory? You hit it right on the head. Communicate, 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 okay? One of the things with sex that I find in my practice is, is that even the most liberal have trouble talking about it. Absolutely, okay. yeah. And so, you know, it's okay to, you know, talk if it's a joke or something like that, but to actually ask for Tongue what you cheek, need. Yeah, yeah actually mm -hmm. ask for what you need and to, you know, say I'm struggling in this area sometimes can, can be really hard. It's very vulnerable to tell someone else that you're struggling, okay? Especially in our sexuality because we identify with it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So the advice that I would give is really communicate with your partner if you're experiencing anxiety or depression that it's it's active and that, that there is an issue so that they don't this is what I'm going through yeah partners not left guessing trying to figure out what what's going on mm -hmm. and if you're feeling as a as the partner that you're not ha getting the attention that you need in a very patient respectful way broach the subject so that um, this is for the partner yes mm -hmm. for the partner so in a patient respectful way um, you know talk to your to the person who might be experiencing anxiety and depression about how you're um, experiencing them. Okay? That, that's a really great point. And uh, you know how sometimes people, they think partners, you and I have both heard partners say, snap out of it. Mm. Can you, before you go, comment on that one? Well, it's, it's a lot like telling a, you know, a deaf person to listen, listen closer. Okay? Brilliantly put. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. And because um, there are um, actual changes that happen in the brain and in, in pe people's physiology that are very much impacted by the presence of, and you know, symptomology of anxiety and depression. And so, and when you understand that, it's a- So it, education. Yeah, so you really yeah. have to understand that it's not a choice, that they're not actually That's choosing to be like that. When I counsel um, menopausal women is, they'll think, you know, I'm getting older, my partner's not interested in me, my vagina doesn't look or feel the way it once did. And they have no idea that maybe he's not approaching you because he's struck, uh, struggling with ED and he's really embarrassed about it. So they just kind of personalize it because they're getting older at the same time, but um, to talk about this stuff with someone like yourself, but also amongst each other, so that you know that maybe you're both struggling with your own stuff and it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with your partner not being attractive. The woman in his head isn't the woman in his bed, or she stopped desiring him. What do we do when that chemistry and desire is gone? How do we reignite it? We're talking about it tonight with uh, Carlisle Jansen, sex coach. What do you do when you get to that place? It's really challenging, but if you have 
respect and love, it makes it much easier to move forward. And what we need to do, I think we need to start by dating again. Mm -hmm. Because so many people stop dating. We spend energy at the beginning, we get dressed up, we plan fun things, we do surprises, we have some mystery. It's all kind of fun and playful. It's playful. And then after a while, we take each other for granted and we don't really do anything special. We stop cherishing each other like we do in the dating yeah, yeah, and we go out in sweatpants. <laughs> I tell people, dress up the way you would on a first date. Absolutely. Plan yeah. what you would plan for a first date and, and treat each other as though it's the first time, as though you really care about them, as though you want to seduce them. And it can feel like the first time if you're putting an effort. And the sad Absolutely. thing is that we plan so much when we're dating and later on we expect things to just spontaneously happen yeah. and people say spontaneous spontaneous but i said there's nothing wrong with planning mm -hmm. you planned when you first started out look how well it turned out absolutely we planned what we were going to wear where we were going to go a new a new toy or a new position so we need to kind of take turns planning and plan surprises for each other and i think we think that it's just going to naturally we're just sort of supposed to fall in love and stay there until the end of time because that's the way it is in Hollywood. I know <laughs> but the Hollywood <laughs> movies last two hours maybe a little bit longer and we can do more than two hours yeah. we can even pull off two years but after yeah. those two years when we don't have that uh, those feel-good hormones getting us high and stoned and we're in the attachment phase we can actually do more stuff because we're more comfortable but people think you're right that it's supposed to happen automatically and so, so it's about putting an effort. Yeah and we have to create that chemistry. Create. Mm -hmm. I think that we fall in love but then we have to create the love and sustain the love. What are some of the ways that we can create that chemistry? I know spending fun time together is important. Dating is important. What yeah. are some of the things that people can do maybe sensually that would help them create that and, and kind of get in touch with that? Well, I think spending time kind of cuddling, touching, making out, giving massages. Making out, I like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and just kind of lying there and touching. Um, you know, watching TV, giving each other a foot massage or stroking each other's back. Just that kind of physical contact, I think, is really important, not just when you're having sex, but on a regular basis. Sending sexy text messages to each other. And it, I'm not saying things that are going to get you into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> you mentioned that. <laughs> but, you know, you looked really hot when you left this morning. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, I can still remember, you know, how good you tasted or yesterday. Your scent. I yeah. still have your scent on my body. Yeah. yeah. Those things are so sexy. So it's just basically you're saying that engage all of the senses mm -hmm. when you're trying to kind of court each other. And eye contact. Eye contact is so important. Yes. Just looking into each other eyes yes like we used to when we gazed before and telling each other what you love about each other you know I think we again think oh you know that I love you right but no I think you look really hot in that outfit or you know you made me feel really special who doesn't want to hear that absolutely and also maybe knowing each other's love languages because sometimes yes. we express things differently yes Mark I'm finding that more and more people are doing away with that hardcore romance even though it's so important so can you please begin the discussion by telling us why why is romance so important? Well, when you the word romance itself uh, suggests uh, mystery. Mystery. It's not just excitement, which is what so many people play on romance. So, you know, probably if you asked most males about romance, they'd be thinking about getting laid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Where and women will be thinking roses rose, and candles they, and they dinner. They might. Uh -huh. not, not always, yeah. but I'm just I'm uh -huh. saying just in a general sense. But there's that. The, the word romance actually originally comes from a place that talked about chivalry. Chivalry. Right. And so one author talks about, you know, every man's uh, um, dream is to, to go on an adventure, uh, slay a dragon, and win a beauty. And if you talk to women, if I said wow. to them, how many women out there want to marry that guy? They'd all put their hands up because yes. it's our adventure, I'm the beauty, and they're my dragons. That's amazing. And so it's in, in that kind of um, understanding, you begin to start unraveling the mystery of romance and the differences. So if, if he always approaches uh, romance from a masculine, then the feminine in her is not getting filled. Right. And then there's a disconnect. Uh-huh. So it's about sort of tapping into each other's psyche to make it happen. Right. So so men need sex in order to feel love, but women need to feel loved in order to have sex. Sex, right. And I would say to any male, I'd love to tell you it works both ways. 
generally it doesn't. If you want to have a robust sex life, you need to learn how to romance your wife, how to woo her. And you know what, in the beginning, when people are doing that, where they're wooing her, pursuing her, making her feel special, that's when they get laid all the time. I mean, it's the limerence stage too, but that's when you get laid because you're doing that. So I said, do the math. You've done away with this, and suddenly right. you're expecting your sex life to be untarnished right. and to stay as robust as the beginning. So I think there's a lot of similarity, similarity between romance and foreplay. Mm -hmm. As one author puts it, foreplay begins in the kitchen. You know, it's not... Uh, you know, she comes down and says, I'm pooped, and he all of a sudden goes, hey, you know, I'm feeling it. Let's and do it. Let's yeah. do it. And she's kind of looking at him like, you know, ain't going to happen, buddy. Right. And you know what's funny? I'll have lots of clients where she'll say, you know, after I've done the dishes and I've, uh, you know, put the kids to sleep and I've done this, that, and she's giving me a list of things. And I'm thinking, I'm exhausted just listening to you. So I'm thinking, you want sex. Why aren't you helping her with some of that right. stuff? Because if you do, then she has more time, she has more energy, and she feels significant. Well, and, and again, all those activities she's doing by herself. So she, she's creating a, an environment for her that it's just her. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's nothing, there's no reminder, oh, I have a partner in my life. And in that, then when it comes to going to bed, for example, at this point, it's like, I can do that myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't it's need you, I don't, as opposed to you're with me and we're doing this together. Well, it, it may not be so much that it, I don't need you. I'm just not thinking about you. The key in romance is, is communicating to their partner that the things that I'm doing are saying that I'm always thinking about you during my day. Absolutely. And you know how Sue Johnson says interdependence. Yes. So it's not necessarily dependent or clingy or independent. Mm -hmm. It's relying on each other right. and having a sense of that coupleship. Sure. Awesome. Now, what are some of the most common obstacles that damper that desire for romance? Well, probably the, you know, the most obvious one is a, a, an argument. Mm -hmm. Right? Because mm -hmm. then we personalize it. You don't love me. What? I marry you. All those kinds of silly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. narratives we play in their head. The meanings we attach. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Um, certainly attachment issues can play a role. So certain attachment issues um, say, you know, I love you. Go away. <laughs> don't leave me. You <laughs> right. Know? Right. Um, and so uh, for some people, because of family of origin issues, proximity is enough. I don't just you sitting on the couch is enough. I don't need to touch you. I don't need to talk to you. But if you got up and left, I would panic. It could also be the person whose love language is quality time. Absolutely. So lack thereof means you don't love me, and that yep. panic sets in. And we know with you know with with love languages, you know, if your love language is to spend time with me and mine's, you know, acts of service, that if you don't do things for me, I don't feel loved. But if I don't spend time with you, you don't feel loved. And we tend to speak our own love language, which gives our partner a sense that they're not cared for. It's learning to speak the other person's love language Absolutely. that pulls that out, right? So to use your example, let's say yours is acts of service. You're in the kitchen. You're cooking a beautiful meal for me. And I'm sitting there alone yes. and lonely. And I'm saying, Mark, I'd rather you come sit with me right. and chat with me. You know, you don't need to make this elaborate meal. You know, we can throw some, something in the oven and forget about it. And we're both feeling unloved or because you're saying, why aren't you helping me? Yeah. You know, why, come on in here. You know, let's uh, taste cut up all the vegetables for the salad together. And that's you know? romantic, yeah. And so it's it's that, that sense of, of camaraderie and partnership that is just so important in in um, maintaining romance. Uh -huh. Giacomo Casanova was neither rich nor attractive, but he was a big believer in romance. He'd plan each evening as if he was going to propose, and to him he was, not marriage, but sex. And as such, he could have any woman he wanted at a time when those things were frowned upon. Sadly, a lot of guys think that they have to be rich or good-looking to be romantic and to do romance right. But you have some great tips for any guy to do romance. So can you real quick give us your top ideas for guys to be romantic? Probably the best thing is, first of all, a mindfulness uh, tip, which is really just thinking about what we call the 1% solution. What can I do today that can communicate to my partner, I love them, I think about them, they float my boat, uh, whatever the case may be, 1% more today than they, than they believed yesterday. Oh, I love that. Because anybody can do 1%. 
right? It's so tiny, huh? Men tend to, you know, try to create the big event. You know, I'm taking you to Hawaii. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll go to, you know, a restaurant. The uh, dinner's going to be 300 bucks, and, you know, I'll buy it. need that. Mm -hmm. And most women will tell you it's very nice, but many women will say, that really isn't what floats my boat. When we talk about makeovers, there's this assumption that something's gone wrong. People falling out of love, for instance. Why does that happen, Dr. Weiss? Well, sometimes we're, we're making over from like a disaster. Sometimes we're making over from just kind of average or okay and, and taking it to another level. But what happens is, you know, your question's great because people falling out of love, it doesn't happen. What they do is they fall out of the disciplines that caused the love. And when you fall out of the disciplines, you fall out of love. Okay, because when you're dating, you spend quality time. When you're dating, you share your heart. You spiritually connect. You give each other physical, physical affection. You listen to each other. You praise each other. Those are all disciplines you don't know that you're actually doing. But those disciplines led to the feeling of, I can't do without you. And, and then what happens is you get married. And you start managing things and getting more committed to work. And the disciplines that got you there disappear. It's kind of like the person who actually went on diet, got in shape, got ready for whatever event they were doing. And then afterwards, they went back to donuts and ice cream and sodas and not taking care of themselves. And they wonder, how did I gain that weight back? You create <laughs> different disciplines. It's so well put because I always say to people, like, do the math. Are you doing the stuff that you did initially when you're falling in love? And invariably, mm -hmm. they're not. So how does one recapture that loving feeling? Um, you know, obviously said to keep up with the disciplines, dating each other, for instance. Um, but there seems to be a lot of confusion around what that looks like when you're married. So maybe you can talk about that next, as in how often... Well, I think hot dating, like, you get married to keep your date. Like, that's the way I did. I, I wanted to date Lisa for the rest of my life, so I wanted a hot date, so I married her. I didn't want any, anyone else having her, right? So what you want to do is have dating in your marriage, okay? So let me give you some guidelines. Dating is not running errands. Home Depot, uh, Tim Hortons... <laughs> and is not a date, that's running errands, okay? Uh -huh. It is not talking about problems, mm -hmm. okay? So you don't wanna make your date a disaster. And it's also um, not shopping unless both people agree. She can't run him to the mall for a date, he can't run her to a boat show for a date, unless they both agree. Hey, let's go antiquing, that sounds like fun, let's go. Okay, now it's three or four hours of fun, and one of the best things, Rebecca, is to rotate responsibility. So one week, it'd be your date. You decide where you want to go. You're not trying to make your husband happy. You're trying to make Rebecca happy, okay? And the next date, it's his date. He decides where he wants to go, how he wants to have fun. And you just rotate this back and forth every week or every other week, no less than that. And if you fall out of dating, then set a consequence. Okay, if we don't date, we'll give $100 to somebody we really don't like. I really like that because that's going to make you stick to the plan. And you're right, it has to be something fun. I always tell my clients at least two or three hours. You can't talk about chores or finances mm -hmm. or kids. It should be something that you're both enjoying. But I really like that uh, you have to give $100 to somebody you don't like because that way you're going to stick to it. Now, well, see, that's the discipline. That's the discipline that's of dating. The, that's right. When so you this... have the discipline of dating, you have the feelings of liking each other. Right. Right, and there's consequences if you don't put an effort. Now, another thing you talk about in your books is sharing feelings. Um, mm -hmm. And you actually have couples do a feeling exercise. What exactly is that, and how often should a couple do this? Well, you should share your feelings every day, okay? And so there's an exercise, and what you do is, uh, to start with, for the first 90 days, get the skill. I feel blank when, like I feel calm when I'm hanging out of my hammock here in Colorado. I first remember feeling calm when, you know, I was looking at clouds when I was with my sister and we were making shapes out of them. I was nine years old. And that gives you kind of the emotional vocabulary for 90 days. And then after that, just two, two feelings from your day, uh, sharing your feelings, spiritually connecting, nurturing each other. Those disciplines bring feelings. Okay. And this is what, I mean, Western culture resists that. They want the results without the work. They want a six pack by taking a pill instead of by, instead of changing their diet and actually getting it done. 
and changing your lifestyle, yeah, and putting some work right. into it, and that's just it, enjoying the work, the journey itself. There are many times, uh, I know you get up really early, but there are many people who say, when I first get up in the morning, I don't feel like working out, but once they get going, uh, it feels great. So again, I think sometimes we can feel lazy in our relationships, but once we do that investment, we're gonna feel good, just like you described. Now, another well, area- I, Rebecca, I've had couples who were so disconnected, they didn't have sex in 10 or 20 years. Wow. Now, I don't know if you can imagine sleeping next to someone and not having sex for over a decade or two. And within days or a few weeks of doing what I asked them to do, they were not only having sex, they liked each other again because they put the disciplines back in their relationship that caused those feelings. What is the secret to a long lasting marriage? A couple of bubbles. A couple bubble basically is the idea uh, that two people are protecting each other from the outside world. It's us against them, me and you against the world. It's kind of like being in a foxhole together. And the purpose of this is strictly biological. It's to protect each other from the outside environment. How do we do that? We have each other's backs. We protect each other in public and private. We know each other like a book. We're experts on each other. We tell each other everything. We're the first to know we're the go-to people. Basically, we are tethered together. We use each other not as exclusives because we have friends and family, of course, but we're the top of the food chain. We're the roof of the house. We're the major people that we have to protect and watch out for because that's part of surviving and thriving in the world. Learn more about forming a couple bubble in my book, Wired for Love.